foreign countries and bring you home to your own land. And on that further along, on, on the day I cleanse you from all your sins, I will repopulate your cities and cause the ruins to be rebuilt, and so on, and so on, and so forth. And the nations left around you will know that I, Yahweh, have rebuilt what was destroyed and replanted what was ruined. And the Lord always says this, to grant them further favor, I shall end it. It goes on like that. Uh, and then you have the bones passage, which is the standing up of the, of the bones. And finally, so Ezekiel is quite, is quite incredible. But in all this, he speaks of himself as son of man. So that's the first usage of son of man. Then the material that we're going to get next time, when we read Daniel next time, is going to be one like a son of man. And just to run over to Daniel quick before we have a break here. And you see, we will get back to the history, I promise now. But let me just run over to Daniel here. Look here in chapter 7 in, in uh, Daniel 7, 12. We get this again when we look at it. It's about the horns and the animal, the horns that are uprooted. And everyone thinks this is the Seleucid Empire. You don't even know what the Seleucid Empire is yet. I'm going to tell you that next time. Anyway. These are the kings in the Seleucid Empire down to the 11th horn where the Jews celebrate in their Hanukkah festivities as Antiochus Epiphanes, um, <coughs> the 11th horn. I gazed and I saw in the visions of the night, it's the most, one of the most famous passages in the whole Bible, certainly for Christians. I saw coming on the clouds of heaven one like a son of man. He came to the one of great, great age and he was led into his presence and on him was confirmed sovereignty, glory, kingship, and men of all pe peoples, nations, and language became his servant. His sovereignty is an eternal sovereignty which will never pass away, nor will, will his empire ever be destroyed. That is the prophecy that almost all of Christianity has plugged into. And that's where they get the Son of Man. But you see, it isn't the Son of Man. So where in the New Testament we have the Son of Man is, there's a problem there, let's put it that way. Uh, there's no one called the Son of Man, just someone overseas who didn't understand this material well thought there was. So did Jesus say the Son of Man came eating and drinking? No, I don't think so. He may have said something like that, but he didn't use those words. And that's the problem. No tape recorders with that. Okay, you guys, you're all angry with me. I know I've gone off the subject. Take this break. At quarter of, we'll come back, and we shall finish the history down to the divided monarchy. I promise we're going to run that. I apologize. I got off the subject. Never mind. Oops, pardon me. <laughs> right. So um, I did, did want to say one thing about that Ezekiel. You you heard it, but I wanted to finish up before that tape ran out there. Uh, Ezekiel, if you if you listen to it, you'll see that um, you know many evangelicals, uh, fundamentalists, and others, not so much Catholics. I don't think they read the Old Testament as seriously as uh, fundamentalists and evangelicals do, and probably Mormons do. Uh, they're very Zionistic, more so than a lot of Jews because of the Zion. mentioned, I think, uh, many Jews don't read the Old Testament very much either. They read portions or something, but they don't read it through sometimes very carefully, certainly not the non-legal portions of the Old Testament. And um, you see, for many Protestants, Israel is the modern miracle. That's why you have so many Zionistic uh, congregations like Chuck Smith's uh, congregation down there in uh, Maranatha, I guess it's called, in Orange County and others. The pastors, you know, they know that the Israel, you know, answers Ezekiel's prophecy to some extent that we just read. Uh, you know, return, the building, the waste places, and so on and so forth. He's doing it for his great name, the Lord Yahweh's great name, and so on. So, so those classes, I didn't spend enough time on that because I was rushing through it because this is not a class on that subject. But uh, those passages uh, inspire many Protestant evangelical uh, congregations with their understanding that, okay, for them Jesus is coming after that. That's fair enough. That's how they want to see it. That's, that's fair enough for them to see it. But first they feel, you know, Israel must be restored, if you want to call it that. And they get that from uh, taking these biblical passages seriously. And you say, well, why do you say they should take it seriously? I don't say they should or shouldn't. Why would they take that seriously when you say they should, you know, it's just poetry. Yeah, that is poetry, what we just read. That, that's not fact. 
But you see, that's what prophecy is. Prophecy is a kind of intense poetry. Rap, if you want to call it in the modern language, you can put that to music easily in Hebrew or English. And, and it's a moral kind of poetry that is tied to uh, quasi-prediction, not always a prediction of future events. Sometimes it's just a commentary on the present in, the, in that heightened poetic style. Um, but it's speaking in the name of God, too. That may be the only um, um, assumption that the writer makes, that he has uh, pretense, if you like, that he is allowed or can speak in the name of God, the same as uh, Muhammad uh, makes that in the Quran and others. Uh, so either you accept that they uh, can do that or not. I mean, they've created God, and if you like, they've created the idea of what God is through their poetry, or their, uh, you know, um, more intense language, if you want, presentation of history and events and the situation of the world. So they, uh, they have the right, let us say, to speak in his name, since that's the image they're using for their understanding of the universe. So yes, um, but so you say, why is that different from an event in a, in a gospel or, the, or, or Moses putting his hand in his shirt and it's leprous and he takes it out and it's not leprous or throwing a stick down and it turns into a snake and then picking it up and it's not a snake. By the way, in Egypt, people can do that. They can make snakes very stiff like a stick. So I'm sure that reflects a certain, you know, um, way magicians back in old Egyptian times behaved in, to impress the public. Uh, I've been to Morocco and places like that and I've seen what their squares are like with all kinds of crazy people out there doing all sorts of things to impress the public with their powers even today. So yeah, uh, magic magicians and so on were thought of being able to do that. Again, one of my things about Jesus in the scripture, good or bad, if you like or not, that's up to you, is that he's presented like a Hellenistic God. He walks through walls as if they're not there. He, he enters rooms where there's a, no door or anything like that. He suddenly appears and so on. Uh, you know, uh, he demands, like he said, the poor you have with you always, but uh, me you only have now. He likes the fact that someone is washing his uh, feet with, uh, with oil and uh, bathing it with her tears and her hair and kissing them and stuff. You know, that's how the Hellenistic world presented their gods, like Asclepius and uh, Apollo and Dionysus in particular. I don't know if you've ever read uh, Euripides, the, the, the tragic uh, 